On April 12, 1961, the Soviet media reported the successful launch, orbit, and re-entry of the first man in space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Celebration erupted worldwide at the cosmonaut's single orbit and the Soviet Union's landmark achievement. Gagarin went on to become one of the greatest heroes in history. With the breakup of the former Soviet Union and the rise of democracy in the Russian Federation, a shocking truth has been unearthed. Access to recently declassified documents in the Kremlin archives by Western journalists, coupled with newly forthcoming eyewitnesses, now confirm that Yuri Gagarin, the symbol and heroic icon of the Soviet Empire, was not the first man in space. This honor belongs to Vladimir Ilyushin. It is now clear that the world-famous Soviet test pilot, Vladimir Ilyushin, was the real first man in space. Numerous accounts of his flight leaked out at the time, and the Kremlin archive documents, along with the eyewitness accounts, only now confirm the accuracy of these original stories. After several decades of propaganda, lies, and official denials, the truth about one of humanity's greatest achievements can now be told. After more than five years of research, the whereabouts of the actual first man in space was learned. Although now in his 70s, retired Air Force General Vladimir Ilyushin still works as one of the designers at the Sukhoi Design Bureau, a Moscow-based fighter jet manufacturer. General Ilyushin was a celebrated test pilot of over 145 aircraft, including the Sukhoi 27, the premier Russian interceptor fighter jet. In piecing together this real-life puzzle of a space mission gone wrong and the subsequent cover-up, the producer spent two full days in Russia with Ilyushin, where he displayed the family museum and offered a glimpse into his amazing life story. Although Ilyushin promised to reveal his story on camera, upon the producer's arrival in Russia, he chose to steadfastly maintain his secrecy. Oddly, he revealed many other facts about his life never before made public that clearly indicated his involvement in the Soviet space program. In order to explain Ilyushin's fear, it is important to understand both the dynamics of the former communist Soviet regime and the top military secrecy in the Soviet space program from its earliest beginnings. In a feat most experts thought impossible, the Soviet Union ushered in the space age on October 4, 1957, when the satellite Sputnik, weighing in at over 100 kilograms, was secretly launched into Earth orbit. Upon the success of Sputnik, people around the world were shocked and dismayed when they realized that the Soviet payload could just as easily have been a nuclear warhead, capable of being delivered anywhere on the planet. After uh, Sputnik was launched, uh, Soviet uh, press published very modest reports of some small objects was delivered to the orbit. Uh, but uh, government clearly was uh, surprised uh, by tremendous uh, outpouring of emotions by international media. And uh, finally they thought, look, this little toy can uh, give in our hands a very important political and propaganda instrument. The success of the Sputnik launch was due entirely to the brilliance and determination of the head of the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev. Korolev was not the genius engineer. He was not a scientist. He was a good engineer. But he was the genius manager. He could manage all these huge people. He will put them together. Without Karolov, it was impossible to do something because all these scientists will uh, be like the ants from one side, from the one side to the other. They will now work together. And he create all the, put them together like this queen ant. They, they work for him. Nobody knew about Sergei Karolov and nobody met him that uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think the name, in my time there, I don't think the name Korolev was even known. He, 
He was always referred to as the designer, uh, never by name. And he never appeared at any of the press conferences in my day. The Nobel Prize Committee approached the Soviet leadership for the purpose of awarding the Nobel Prize to the designer of the Sputnik's rocket booster, along with the accompanying accolades and money that emanate from the honor. However, the Soviet government and leader Nikita Khrushchev would not permit the award to go to the individual responsible for the success or allow him to leave the country to accept the award. So it's have no reasonable explanation. It's even difficult not explain to Americans, but to Russians now, why nobody wanted to give the name of Karolov when the Nobel Committee asked this because they want to give him Nobel Prize. And the Soviets told, no, no, we don't interest in Nobel Prize. He is secret. So it is part of this, of this society, part of this uh, society was just recovering from the Stalin history. It's take, taking a long time. By the late 1950s, it was clear to both the United States and the Soviet Union that the next space challenge would be to send a human into orbit. Several highly trained military jet test pilots were chosen by both nations to literally go where no man had gone before. The Soviet space program remained a highly secretive branch of the military. Test pilots became known as cosmonauts. Космонавты становились известными только после того, как они слетали в космос. До того, космонавты became famous only after they had been in space. Before then, no one was allowed to tell anyone what they did. The rule was made so as not to attract attention to those people who were to become cosmonauts and also to be able to cover up the truth if any accidents occurred. In the 1960s, the Soviets were very secretive about their space program. Pictures would be condensed, things in the background would be changed. For what appears to be no apparent reason, but uh, we can tell that the, the Russians were trying to be secretive, that they were, they were uh, covering up something uh, and not being totally truthful. Uh, we have photographs where, uh, where we believe a cosmonaut in training has been airbrushed away. In October 1960, the most tragic example of the fanatical paranoia of Soviet secrecy occurred. A huge new booster rocket appeared to malfunction at the time of launch. Instead of lifting off, it remained fixed in the launch pad. Ignoring all warnings and flagrantly overriding safety precautions, the Kremlin ordered the launch director and engineers to repair the problem immediately in order to get the rocket launched that same day. Marshal Nedelian, who was the head of rocket uh, strategic forces, personally uh, uh, sitting in the chair next to the rocket was in preparation before the launch. He demanded that uh, this chair should be brought next to the rocket. And uh, it was completely against all the safety regulations. And uh, everyone around knew that this is against uh, the safety regulations, but uh, everyone thought, look, if I wouldn't get uh, 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 placed next to the big uh, boss, uh, I might be f uh, fired ne to ne next day from my job. With more than 200 men inspecting the rocket, including the launch director Nadellin, a huge ball of fire suddenly erupted, instantly killing everyone nearby. No list of the people who died was ever compiled, and no one will ever know just how many people died that day. Amazingly, this historic tragedy was continually denied by the Soviets, and the tragic details of this event were not revealed by the Soviet government for almost 30 years. 
Other recently declassified Kremlin documents also indicate that as many as seven cosmonauts were killed in training accidents prior to Gagarin's reported flight. Cosmonauts Lodovsky, Shiborin, Mitkov, Dolgov, Belokonev, Kachur, and Garachev were never honored for being the pioneers they were, giving their lives in attempts to reach space. They will instead remain as mere names on a secret list of cosmonauts who perished in training accidents. That was the point at which a lot of these guys became increasingly clear that they had been shafted. And uh, they became angry, and there was a lot of anger. But they couldn't do anything. There was no place to go. There was no free press. There were only family members to hear their stories, and after a while, they had told those stories, and what more could they do? Ну, конечно, все было построено на пропаганде в России. Естественно, все было засекречено. Говорилось одно, делалось совершенно другое. Everything was built on propaganda and everything was secret. It was always this way and everybody knew about it. The newspapers and radios said one thing and what really happened was something different. What the Soviet propagandists did not understand was that by presenting the difficulties, the problems, the mistakes, the accidents, the mishaps, they could have presented a far better picture of the Soviet Union than in fact they did. That, that to present everything as perfect was in fact to belittle the achievement of the Soviet Union, to belittle the achievement of the Soviet people. And to depict it in that light was to underestimate the heroism, the struggle, the effort of the Soviet people and, you know, show completely, a completely inept approach. As a result of the Soviet Union's reported technological achievements, while at the same time hiding its failures, positive perception of communist philosophy was at its peak. Khrushchev reportedly became obsessed with the idea of being the first to successfully launch a man in space and ordered Korolev to make it happen regardless of cost. At that time, Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin was unquestionably the Soviet Union's most famous and experienced test pilot. As a test pilot, Ilyushin set dozens of speed and altitude records and also held the world altitude record of nearly 30 kilometers, which he set in 1959 using a Sukhoi 9 military interceptor jet. In late 1960, Ilyushin was awarded the hero of the Soviet Union, their highest military honor, for his altitude records. Equivalent to the prestigious American Congressional Medal of Honor or a British knighthood, this Soviet award was bestowed upon a select few. Ilyushin himself was the offspring of the most distinguished military and aircraft engineering family in the Soviet Union. His father, Sergei, was one of the most famous heroes in the Soviet Union, designing and building many of the fighter and bomber planes that contributed to saving the Soviets from the invading Nazis at the height of World War II. Sergei Ilyushin, the designer, uh very much involved in World War II fighter planes. And the Soviets, with the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, the IL-2 Sturmovik was probably the most famous of all the Russian aircraft, being a, a ground attack aircraft. So this gave him huge stature under Stalin, and then of course uh, Khrushchev when he took over. In addition, Sergei Ilyushin was also one of the most powerful men in the Soviet Union, having been awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union three times, and being a member of the inner sanctum of Soviet power as a distinguished deputy leader of their parliament, the Supreme Soviet. After World War II, the elder Ilyushin correctly envisioned the future of aircraft manufacturing as requiring the transition from military to civilian production. Once again, 
Ilyushin showed his brilliance in designing and manufacturing some of the best civilian passenger jet airplanes ever made. The Ilyushin Aviation Complex was considered by many to be one of the world's finest civilian airplane manufacturing companies. Ilyushin would, would be respected and, uh, in Soviet society, not because he had three awards, but be why he got the three awards, which, because of his which was because of his work as an aircraft designer and his, his contribution to the develop, post-war development of Soviet civil aviation was outstanding. The younger Ilyushin was always fearful of being lost or stuck in his father's larger-than-life image and set out to free himself from his father's shadow. The younger Ilyushin did not want to be groomed to take over his father's civilian airplane manufacturing company. Instead, he entered test pilot school, then went on to design and test pilot military jet fighters. In a final act of defiance, Vladimir joined the Sukhoi Aircraft Company in 1952, his father's most bitter personal rival. The elder Ilyushin is said to have been enraged over his son's actions, remaining highly incensed for several years. Throughout the 1950s, the relationship between elder and younger Ilyushin was non-existent but ultimately culminated in one of mutual pride and respect for each other's accomplishments. Vladimir Ilyushin reportedly snubbed the thought of flying in space when it was first offered to him, regarding it as fit only for dogs and lab rats. The Soviet space capsule was to be operated exclusively by mission control engineers via remote control. No hands-on cosmonaut actions were required, which was an uninteresting prospect for the best test pilot of the era. Still, most of Ilyushin's accomplished fellow test pilots did join the cosmonaut corps in spite of this obvious handicap. At some point shortly after being bestowed the hero of the Soviet Union honor, Ilyushin changed his mind. He began to actively pursue the idea of becoming the first man in space. Ilyushin began to view space as his personal opportunity to separate himself from his larger-than-life father and become an immortal hero on his own and in a field apart from aviation. One of the powerful things that the Aleutians brought to Russia was a sense of a dynasty. There's a group of families who were significant historically, and the Aleutians were certainly one of those. And uh, the fact that it was all in the same sphere in aviation and aerospace sciences was significant. It was therefore, in my view, no accident that Vladimir Lushin would have been picked as the man for the job. I mean, it was an obvious choice. Uh, he was the right age. Uh, he had the right training. He had the name. It would have been perfect had it worked. And that was what first got me interested in the story, was the obviousness that this would have been the logic of the communist regime to pick Lushin for the job. As a result of his professional accolades, coupled with his family's tremendous political influence, Lieutenant Colonel Ilyushin was ultimately given his chance to become the first man in space. Ilyushin doggedly engaged in months of intense catch-up training necessary to prepare him for his chance at immortality, even though his fellow cosmonauts were well into their second year of spaceflight training. Vladimir, who I knew Vladimir, whom I knew well, was very happy, smart, and he was always helpful to others. During his training, he was intense, detail-oriented, and meticulous. All assignments he did to perfection, and the results were the best of any cosmonaut in training. As secretive as a Soviet space program was, there were a number of leaks as to Ilyushin's imminent flight, possibly as a result of his enormous celebrity as the man who had been closest to achieving true spaceflight with his altitude records and the natural choice to be the first man in space. In early 1961, a photograph of Ilyushin wearing space gear was published 
and it was said he was undergoing training as a cosmonaut. My job was to film all aspects of Vladimir's lunch. Vladimir was the nicest, happiest, friendliest pilot I have ever seen. Vladimir was confident and determined, and he was ready for this day. According to declassified documents, Ilyushin was put into the capsule named Rossiya and launched in top military secrecy early in the morning on Friday, April 7th, 1961. I was just so excited to be a part of this whole thing. And I was thinking to myself how most people could only read about history. And here I was being a part of history. At the time, the CIA and other military intelligence organizations neither confirmed nor denied the detection of the launch or the flight. Even after several decades, CIA and U.S. State Department documents are still classified on this issue. It is presumed that Western intelligence agencies neither wanted to tip their hand as to their capabilities in detecting Soviet launches and orbits, nor to reveal their sources. Earlier in the year, just a few months before, I had seen a photograph of, of Vladimir Ilyushin wearing space gear and referred to as a member of the, uh, the cosmonaut group, training for cosmonaut. Therefore, when I heard the story that Vladimir Ilyushin had been up in space, it fitted. Now, I was so sure at that time that the story was true, I tried to get comment from all the Soviet sources I could. From the uh, press department, from Pravda, from Izvestia, from TASS. From all of them, I got the answer, we don't know. We don't know. But subsequently, I realized they did know. During the flight, there was a malfunction in the electrical system, knocking out the guidance controls and radio. Ilyushin lost consciousness during the third orbit just before re-entry, causing ground control to lose contact with the capsule. So I believe what happened was that, uh, that Vladimir Ilyushin was put into orbit. Something went wrong aboard the spacecraft, uh, whether the, the uh, guidance system or, or whatever, and that for several hours, he was subjected to, to uh, conditions that were not conducive to, to his health. Unlike the Americans who had their early capsules land in the ocean, the Soviet capsules had to land on the hard ground within their borders. Because the Soviets had not yet perfected proper re-entry and landing procedures, cosmonauts were expected to eject between 10,000 and 20,000 feet, then parachute to safety. According to recently revealed Kremlin documents, Ilyushin was unable to eject and made a hard landing in the capsule. Amazingly, he survived. Badly hurt, but alive. The dynamics of orbital mechanics are such that the capsule could only have returned to Russian soil near the planned landing site on the first or the 17th orbit. Ilyushin, however, came down on the third orbit. Kremlin archive documents now indicate that Ilyushin went off course and crash landed in mainland China, not the Soviet Union. He was first detained by villagers, then by local authorities, and ultimately was held in China as an honored guest of the country. Regarding the scenario that involved crash landing in China, uh, one of the things that the cache of documents which I had a chance to rifle through in the archive, 
I did notice quite a few documents referring to Chinese Communist Party officials in this period of time, which was not the best period for Sino-Soviet relations, asking questions about the nature of the space program and the direct connection to Aleutians being there. Those questions that were raised by Chinese Communist Party officials about the Soviet space program were directly connected to an incident on their own soil. I think that's certainly, for future researchers and investigators, a definite path to pursue. The worst possible case scenario for the Soviet Union now came true, with their mission in shambles and their hero in the hands of their enemies. The Soviet leadership was in total confusion about what to do. At first, there were many indications that the Soviets were going to publicize the flight. Ultimately, they refused to acknowledge the foreign reports and later, forcefully but sloppily, denied the story altogether with several conflicting and contradictory excuses. By that time, however, it was too late. The story had been broken wide open. Dennis Ogden, the Moscow correspondent with the London-based communist newspaper, The Daily Worker, was among the first to get the Aleutian story published, and he still refuses to reveal his informant to this day. But Ogden did confirm that this source had been a well-placed informant that he trusted fully. The Times had a story very similar to the one I had. I'm not surprised that uh, uh, Hungarians and Yugoslavs and other correspondents uh, published such stories or knew of such stories. All correspondents knew of such stories. And uh, we were constantly exchanging phone calls. Have you heard this? Have you heard that? And what do you think of it? Uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. There was one of a French reporter that was there on that day, one from Bulgaria. Uh, various uh, American Air Force people made comments that an attempt was made. And those sources were independent. You know, they wasn't, it wasn't a case of one source and then another by picking it up. They were separate sources. For several decades, the Soviets angrily and profusely denied these stories as fabrications and lies and had propaganda writers discredit, slander, and defame the reputations of these reporters and correspondents. It was only after the collapse of communism and the breakup of the former Soviet Union that access to Kremlin archive documents and memos confirmed the truthfulness and accuracy of these stories about Vladimir Ilyushin. I first heard about the Aleutian story from Russian colleagues who basically whispered it. I got a clear sense that there was something about this story which I hadn't heard about in the West that needed to be pursued, but it took, uh, I guess from the first time I heard about it to the time when I was able to get access to some documents, it took about eight years. In a society that was built around secrets, the archives are, you know, the most important resource to be protected. Not necessarily to preserve the memory, but to preserve the fictions. So that's one of the reasons why getting access to archival material is still difficult to this day. With the advent of Russian democracy and the availability of substantiating documentation, Ilyushin's story can now be appreciated in full. Finally, I was able to finagle my way into a library, uh, which gave me an opportunity to read some things that I wouldn't have been able to get access to otherwise. And that helped me conclude some of the things that I wrote in the story. There were really three types of documents. There was the pre-launch documentation, there was the catastrophe, and there were documents pertaining to uh, discussions that took place after the event. Back in April 1961, the Soviet media was becoming more and more vociferous, contradictory, and utterly confusing in denying that Ilyushin was in fact the first man in space. 
At first, the story released by the Soviets proclaimed that Ilyushin was never a part of the cosmonaut corps and that he was in excellent health. Then they admitted that Ilyushin was a cosmonaut in training, but was in a car accident the month before and couldn't be the first man in space. Then they reported that Ilyushin was not a cosmonaut in training because he had been in a car accident back in 1959, which was later modified and changed by the Soviet media to mid-1960, and that Ilyushin was in a coma from the time of the accident until March of 1961. Numerous contradictions of this nature added to the skepticism of Western journalists at that time, not the least of which was a photo taken of a healthy Ilyushin in December of 1960, just four months before his spaceflight. The photo showed Ilyushin receiving the Hero of the Soviet Union Award for his altitude record. Obviously, he was not in a coma at that time. The Soviet government never could produce Ilyushin himself during this time to refute the alleged flight but always maintained its insistence through the media that Ilyushin was not the first man in space. The, the confused stories about Ilyushin simply demonstrate the point that I made several times that the Soviet Union was its own worst enemy. The talk of Soviet propaganda being efficient, effective, is just nonsense. I don't believe, I never believe, that the story that Soviet Soviet Union was good at propaganda. It was not. To explain how Ilyushin could be in mainland China at that time, the communist-controlled government media in the Soviet Union reported that Ilyushin was sent to a rehabilitation hospital in China. There were also contradictions and falsehoods given by the Soviets regarding even this story. There were two reports uh, on Vladimir Ilyushin being injured and being sent to China. One of them had him in a Peking hospital, one of them had him in a Hangzhou hospital. Uh, it's very doubtful to me that somebody in a car accident in the Soviet Union, especially the son of a famous aviation designer and somebody himself, a test pilot, a military test pilot, would be sent to a Chinese hospital for uh, recuperation. I never heard of anybody being sent from the Soviet Union to China for medical treatment. And the medical facilities available in the Soviet Union, perfectly uh, satisfactory, probably better than those available in China. And the second point was that, of course, in from during the sec during, uh, towards the end of the 50s and in the early 60s, Soviet-Chinese relations were very strained. And I really couldn't conceive that uh, someone like Ilyushin uh, would, would be sent there. I find it difficult to understand. Obviously, the Soviets were caught in a no-win situation. Khrushchev could not simply cover up this failure with sheer propaganda. But when Khrushchev came to power, he made our society much less closed. But before, everything was secret. Now, still many things remain secret, which had no explanation. Because, for example, he, they told why we have to told to all the world about our failures. It will not help us. All the failures were known only to a narrow circle, and uh, you know there was a kind of uh, oral history. You know, you could learn from friends what happened at the launch. But uh, uh, it was amazing that now, in retrospect, we did not have more failures. I think the way uh, government tried to hide the failures was really detrimental for the program. People wonder why did they not disclose catastrophes? Well, I mean, the easy answer, of course, is that it was embarrassing. Marxist-Leninist economics and Marxist-Leninist politics prided itself on being a scientific objective analysis of human and natural law. 
and if you are really good at your Marxist-Leninist theory, then nothing in the real world should be less than perfect. So it was a great embarrassment not only to disclose this fact externally, but to have to admit it internally in the halls of power. I think they were put in a situation then that, that uh, they didn't have somebody they could present to the public. And here, Khrushchev had been using the space program as, as one of his big uh, propaganda hammers. And to have this kind of, of, of failure, it was intolerable. In an almost unbelievable coincidence, on Saturday, April 8th, 1961, the day after Ilyushin's ill-fated mission, an internal meeting was quickly scheduled by Korolyov for various members of the military and government for the purpose of introducing the next first man in space, Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin. This meeting, however, was not acknowledged until after Gagarin's flight, and the film documentation was not released for several years after the flight. It's difficult to single out any out of six splendidly trained cosmonauts, but it must be done. The Air Force Command recommends Senior Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin for the first flight in space with German Titov as the backup. In hindsight, it is very difficult to even imagine that the cosmonaut chosen to be the very first man in space would be named so hastily and on a Saturday with only three or four days of preparation before the most historic launch in human history was to take place. By comparison to the heroic record-setting test pilot Ilyushin, Gagarin was not even in the same league. He had just recently graduated from flight school and was considered a novice pilot without a single noteworthy achievement to his credit. Gagarin was, however, young, articulate, attractive, and a committed member of the Communist Party. Allow me to assure the Soviet government, the Communist Party and people that I will carry out with honor the task entrusted to me and that I will be able to overcome all difficulties I may encounter the way a good communist should. Five days after the Ilyushin flight, the successful Gagarin mission was reported in the Soviet media. It is noteworthy to point out that Khrushchev was in Moscow at the time of Ilyushin's flight but was on vacation to a remote resort on the Black Sea at the time of Gagarin's launch. Khrushchev was caught totally by surprise when told about Gagarin's flight by phone, and he immediately returned to Moscow, then arranged a tremendous hero celebration with Gagarin. Some Soviet experts now believe that Khrushchev was so overwrought with Ilyushin's failure that he had to go on vacation, and that Korolyov took things into his own hands to launch Gagarin no matter what the consequences without even bothering to tell Khrushchev in the event there might have been another failure. Yuri Gagarin was clearly a political piece uh, that Khrushchev and the Soviet Union used to the maximum extent they could. Uh, after the flight, he was welcomed back in Moscow. Uh, he went on a tour of the world. He went to London and India and he was a spokesman of the Soviet Union. He was the typical, being portrayed as the typical Soviet uh, uh, person, you know, uh, young, aggressive, uh, bright, courageous, you know, everything that they wanted to portray communism to be. An interesting note in a recently declassified State Department document reveals that the leaders of almost every country sent Khrushchev gifts and congratulatory letters over Gagarin's successful flight, with China being the sole exception, choosing to remain mysteriously quiet during the entire affair. However, China did send congratulatory letters to the Soviet leadership on all subsequent Soviet space missions. Perhaps this was the subtle way China could tell the world that they knew Gagarin was not the first man in space. 
With the successful flight of Gagarin, the Ilyushin flight became a non-event. As for those who knew the truth about Ilyushin, such as reporter Dennis Ogden, his informant, and the space program engineers and technicians involved in the flight, each was forced to participate in a conspiracy of silence driven by fear. I got a call, a call from my superior. He told me in no uncertain terms to destroy everything uh, I had on Vladimir and to just keep quiet about the whole affair. From the tone of his voice, I knew clearly that if I didn't do exactly as he said, my family and I would have one-way tickets and a permanent address change to Siberia. I was summoned to the press department to meet the head of the press department, a man called Harlamov. He had been instructed by the Central Committee to conduct an investigation into my story. He said, leaning across the table, I only want to know one thing. Who told you? I said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Why not? Journalistic ethics. And then he blew up in a big way and he said, Yes, but uh, we, we want to know who told you because this person has done great harm. Had I been what was called in Moscow a bourgeois correspondent, a non-communist correspondent, I'm sure I would have been expelled. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but it would have been very embarrassing for them to expel a communist correspondent. Through all the years of propaganda and denials, the story of Vladimir Ilyushin and his spaceflight had been relegated to the garbage can of hoaxes, myths, and fabrications generated by overzealous and imaginative Western reporters. Ogden himself was branded as a fantasy writer and flat-out liar. The Soviets, however, went to extraordinary measures to find out who Ogden's informant was. Ogden was constantly followed by the KGB in hopes of capturing his informant. Both Ogden and his informant feared for their very lives. I went to a reception, and as I, and I sensed that one of my minders was close behind, uh, and as I walked through the door, straight ahead of me was my informant. And I knew that if my minder saw him and me together, that was it. He would know. And I, uh, fortunately, fortunately, my informant saw my minder and realized the situation and just ignored me. Since both China and the Soviet Union were hostile to the West, no press reports were ever made available on Ilyushin's stay in China, nor on any swap for his release. While it is still unclear as to what kind of deal was struck between the Soviet Union and China to get Ilyushin back, in either an exchange of spies or money or both, Ilyushin finally and quietly came home about a year after his flight, and shortly thereafter resumed working in his home for the Sukhoi Aircraft Company in a very low-key manner. Vladimir Ilyushin was in a position uh, that I believe was uh, problematic for Khrushchev and the government. First off, he was a very famous person in his own right. As a test pilot, uh, he was famous because of the family that he was born into and, the, and the, what you would consider to be the elite within the Soviet Union. So I think the, what uh, came down was uh, it was a joint decision that, that Vladimir would just basically just be quiet. The brilliant Soviet space designer Sergei Korolyov also suffered once again from the hysteria and secrecy surrounding the Soviet space program. He was again denied his due, just like Ilyushin was. 
Sergei Korolev was the chief designer of the uh, rocket and spacecraft used for the Gagarin flight, the first manned flights. Uh, the Nobel uh, Committee wanted to give this person a Nobel Prize for the accomplishment. It was a tremendous accomplishment. But under Khrushchev and the tight regime at the time, uh, even those that followed Khrushchev, uh, there was no release of his name uh, at all until, until, in fact, his death in 1966. It is indeed hard to believe that Korolev went to his grave in 1966, having been cheated out of not just one, but two Nobel Prizes for his brilliance. Because Korolev lived in a society where paranoia and cover-ups were the norm, the world never knew or appreciated his unparalleled contribution to space exploration during his lifetime. Looking back at the stories of the personalities, the Khrushchev personality, the Korolev personality, the Gagarin personality, the Aleutian personality, uh, probably the most interesting element of it was the Shakespearean character of the, the, the life that was led after these events by Gagarin and Aleutian. Of course, if Gagarin was not the first in space, he was probably aware of that fact at some point, and that may have led to his demise, alcoholism, and lack of control in public. Apparently, he became uh, very difficult for the Communist Party to cope with because he would say things in public that were an embarrassment, if not outright uh, dangerous. There were even reports of Gagarin throwing a glass of champagne in the face of Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev at a government function. Shortly thereafter, in March 1968, Gagarin died in a highly suspicious and mysterious MiG jet crash. In perhaps the ultimate twist of fate, Vladimir Ilyushin was appointed to lead the committee investigating the crash, whose report was inconclusive and left many nagging questions. Ilyushin himself reported that Gagarin's body was never found, and only a finger of the once great hero was recovered from the wreckage, leading many experts to question whether or not Gagarin may well have been murdered by the KGB at Brezhnev's instructions. Meanwhile, the true conquering hero must continue to live, wrestling with the memory of the life that was due him. The life that was led by Aleutian uh, was actually quite significant. I mean, he did not only work as a test pilot after the fact, but he also uh, became a significant designer. And I think it's kind of tragic that the one man who the world acknowledges still today as the great hero actually may have been a fabrication. And that's kind of a sad end to the story, that the two guys went different ways, and each, in one sense, got the reverse of what you would have expected. The hero wound up being the tragic figure, and the one that they tried to bury turned out to actually make a lasting contribution. Even though this gentle giant of a man must face the statues of Gagarin, visit the buildings that bear Gagarin's name, and participate in the ceremonies that hail Gagarin as the first man in space. Vladimir Ilyusha knows in his heart that it was his accomplishment that broke new ground, not only in the space race of the Cold War, but in the human quest for knowledge, adventure, and conquest. I moved to America several years ago, and I am so happy that the Soviet Union and that the communism are finished. And now, I don't have to keep quiet to protect the Soviet Union's good name. So, if the KGB wants to come after me now, then I'll be waiting for them to spit in their faces after what they did to Vladimir. With the truth at last unveiled, Vladimir Ilyushin deserves to be recognized as the space pioneer and hero he is, rather than as a footnote in a falsified history.
April 12, 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin was launched into space on board the newly developed Vostok 1 rocket booster and capsule. At 9.07 a.m. Moscow time, I heard a whistling sound and an increasing roar. Immediately, the news was spread around the world. The Soviet Union had finally done it, put the first man into orbit. The communist world cheered enthusiastically. Yuri Gagarin was put on display, paraded out in the Soviet Union and hailed as one of the greatest heroes and adventurers of all time. Was Yuri Gagarin really the first man in space? Or did he live the life of a fraud and a lie? Did he really die? And if he is dead, how did he die? Recent developments in brand new declassified evidence now clearly show that there's much, much more than meets the public eye about the secret life and purported death of Yuri Gagarin. By the end of this program, you'll learn startling things about Gagarin. His life was a modern-day version of a Shakespearean tragedy. From in the beginning, being publicly revered as one of the greatest adventurers in human history, but privately feeling like a puppet, a victim, entangled in a political web of deceit and lies. Ultimately, all of the history books of the world will have to be changed to accommodate the truth about Yuri Gagarin. To set the scene for this tragedy, the Soviet Union drew first blood with their successful Sputnik project in the competition between Soviet communism and American democracy and marked the beginning of the space race. The Sputnik was launched into orbit in October 1957 thanks to an intense, almost fanatical determination by Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, and also thanks to the single-handed efforts of Russia's chief rocket designer and engineer, Sergei Korolyov. The success of Sputnik had a profound effect on everyone in the Soviet Union, including young pilots like 23-year-old Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin. Gagarin had just graduated from flight school that June and had also gotten married that same month, just as he was assigned to duty in a fighter jet squadron at a remote Air Force base at the Arctic Circle. Sputnik was a sensation. It let loose both the United States and the USSR, two superpowers exploding into a full-scale battle of technology to see who could conquer space, which nation's expertise would prevail to lead to global domination and influence. However, the Soviet space program was entirely controlled by the military and was not open to the press or exposed to public scrutiny, never showing any failures, only successes. It's just they don't like to expose all the things. Uh, and it, as it was no uh, democracy, it was monarchy, and then it was Soviet state, it was no independent media. So no, nobody can make this uh, discovery. And in Russia, they don't want to expose, they don't want to say this to the people, because you have many other tragedies that they never told. The regime of secrecy in Russia was so powerful, and in the rocket forces you could say it was the ultimate in military secrecy. Every person was under complete control of the KGB, and before anyone was connected to a launch, they were interrogated by the secret agents of the KGB, and they would be warned that they should never, ever tell anybody anything about it. People were prepared very thoroughly by the officers of the KGB, as there were checkups and more checkups. If there was something in your history that was not right, you had absolutely no chance of ever getting in to do anything with the Soviet space program. The Soviet space program was watched over by overzealous, paranoid commanders obsessed with secrecy. As the perfect example of this fanaticism, when the Nobel Prize Committee got together wanting to award a Nobel Prize to the chief designer of the Sputnik rocket, 
Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev was so fixated on keeping secrets that he refused to even identify the designer's name, Sergei Korolyov, responding that the Soviet people put up the Sputnik. Uh, nobody knew about Sergei Korolyov and nobody met him. But uh, I don't think that, uh, I don't think the name, in my time there, I don't think the name Korolyov was even known. He, he was always referred to as the designer. Uh, never by name, and he never appeared at any of the press conferences in my day, because this was the way the Soviet Union approached such things. They, not only in the space sphere, but anything connected with security, with defense, was secret. Ever since the beginning of the space race, accidents and failures and human errors were never ever admitted in the Soviet Union. When they did occur, they were completely covered up, erased from existence by the propaganda machine of the totalitarian Soviet regime. Perhaps the most outrageous, egregious cover-up of the era was when a brand new ICBM was about to be tested. It was in October 1960, and it was the beginning, the first test of the first Soviet ICBM. But, it was the commander of strategic rocket forces, Marshal Nidelin, who feeling that you can do everything. So he uh, bring his chair and he sat under the uh, rocket that was uh, at that time filled with full oxidizer and sitting there. So all other people gathering around, it was hundreds of people. And it is 160 ton of this oxidizer fuel just it was like waterfall, oxidized the fall on top of all these people. It was like a hell because they burned alive. The, from the Martian Nidelin, they found only his keys from his safe. No one ever knew about this disaster, which killed not only Nidelin, head of the rocket strategic forces, but also over 165 military officers and technicians. The Soviet propagandists only allowed the newspapers to publish this one short communique on October 26, 1960, which said, quote, Marshal Nadellin died in an airplane crash, end quote. The Soviet Union was useless at propaganda. Now their propaganda depicted achievements focused on achievements. There was never an accident. There was never a mishap. Uh, crime was hardly ever reported, and, and so on. The picture was of perfection. But everybody, of course, knew that this was not the case. The, the logic of the system was that everything presented to the outside world had to express the purity and perfection of Marxist-Leninist thinking. And this was, this was a fixation at the highest levels, and it permeated down. So everybody was willing to participate in lying as a national pastime because there was a greater purpose, which was that they, as the better system, had to win the Cold War, not only to protect the motherland from another invasion, but to prove that their choice in 1917 was the right choice. Everyone in the world did know that the next big step in the space race was going to be which country could launch a man into space first. By 1959 and into 1960, the Soviets were actively recruiting pilots to train as cosmonauts. Enter Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin, newlywed husband and now new father, who had only about 75 hours of flight time and not even all of that in a jet. He was one of the youthful recruits secretly chosen among 19 or 20 others. Many of the cosmonaut trainees were not necessarily from the Air Force Academy, and it wasn't only test pilots that became cosmonaut trainees. For example, Yuri Gagarin was not a test pilot at all. He was just a young pilot chosen from an air squadron in a remote base in the north with only a few hours of flight time. 
On the other hand, there were also some well-established test pilots chosen to be in the cosmonaut corps that were all highly regarded, like Vladimir Komarov. Cosmonaut training was conducted under the absolute strictest veil of secrecy in a city specifically built for their living and training, off limits to any non-military personnel. Any trainees who dropped out or who died during training were erased from existence, literally, airbrushed out of photographs and any evidence of them destroyed, just like those victims of the Nadellan disaster. Not even parents, wives, or children were allowed to be aware of what their son or husband or father was doing. We are talking about differences in culture. And it is, as I told, uh, we can say it, it was the same culture for many centuries. So it was not the Soviet culture. They don't want to expose the people who didn't exist. So it was a group of cosmonauts, and then it was uh, two of them disappeared. One of them was uh, fired because they caught drunk somewhere. So he was violated, and he fired him. Another, what he was, uh, I think he died in the training under the fire on the oxygen atmosphere. And through this, because culturally, they don't want to mention failure of the, in Russia, that they failed, that these people, one of them was behave wrongly, and hero mustn't behave wrongly. So just they uh, brush them out. And this was, became very common during Stalin time. It's hard for anybody outside the Soviet Union, outside the former Soviet Union, to grasp the systematic, organized character of the secrecy regime that was imposed on the program, on the space program. Not only were there a network of secret cities that didn't show up on maps, that people didn't talk about, that people didn't live in, and that people didn't come from, although in fact they came from those places and they lived in those places and they worked in those places, uh, and they did show up on, on maps that were secret. Um, there was no institutional accountability to anybody. The party was accountable to nobody but itself. When the word went out that pilots were sought for the dangerous venture of space travel, by far the best and most famous Soviet test pilot of that era was Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin. Colonel Ilyushin had over 2,000 hours of flight time as the top fighter jet test pilot for the Sukhoi Design Bureau. Colonel Ilyushin held literally dozens of world speed and altitude records in several types of jets. Ilyushin initially had passed on the offer to become a cosmonaut in training, since in late 1959, he was busily concentrating his efforts on breaking the absolute world altitude record of 100,000 feet in a Sukhoi Su-9, considered at the time the ultimate assessment of bravery and courage for any test pilot. Vladimir Ilyushin was a test pilot, one of the uh, best test pilots of, the, of his generation. He was son of the famous Russian aircraft designer Sergei Ilyushin, who designed the Ilyushin II, the combat plane, the name Sturmovik, the Second World War, and then uh, the many passenger plane, Ilyushin bombers. But they're not related because when you, <laughs> the achievement, he became the test pilot, not because he was the son, because he has his own um, talent to all the things. In December of 1960, Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin was even awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal the highest Soviet award, equal to America's Congressional Medal of Honor. This medal was issued to Colonel Ilyushin as the Soviet Union's bravest test pilot for his valor and daring in appreciation of his setting so many aviation-related records. I mean, clearly there was one of these test pilots that was just far and above everybody else. He was considered to be shoo-in for the first flight in space, and that was Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin. 
I mean, looking beyond the spin doctors and propagandists, he was by far one of the best Soviet test pilots of the young jet era. Um, he made Lieutenant Yuri Garin pale by comparison. Reports now indicate that Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin's personal accomplishments in aviation, combined with his father's larger-than-life reputation in aviation design and political clout as a member of the Supreme Soviet, brought Colonel Ilyushin to the front of the line to become the first man in space. In Russia, there's a group of families who are significant historically. And the Aleutians were certainly one of those. And um, uh, the fact that it was all in the same sphere in aviation and aerospace sciences was significant. Um, it was therefore, in my view, no accident that Vladimir Aleutian would have been picked as the man for the job. I mean, it was an obvious choice. Uh, he was the right age. Uh, he had the right training. He had the name. It would have been perfect had it worked. You know, it's kind of a classic Soviet plan gone bad. In early 1961, a photograph of Illusion wearing space gear was published, and it was said he was undergoing training as a cosmonaut. I've seen a number of reports and communications along with several published accounts by just English, Hungarian, French reporters, including uh, Dennis Ogden, that Vladimir Lucian was in fact launched into orbit in full secrecy on April 7, 1961. Now, one thing about Ogden was that he was one of the most credible investigative reporters of the uh, Moscow region. Uh, for example, he was the one who blew the lid off the biggest story in 1960 when it was Ogden who reported that Francis Gary Powers in a CIA U-2 spy plane was shot down by a Russian missile. I had seen a photograph of, of Vladimir Ilyushin wearing space gear and referred to as a member of the cosmonaut group. Therefore, when I heard the story that Vladimir Ilyushin had been up in space, it fitted. In those days of the Cold War, the late 50s and early 60s, almost all foreign correspondents and reporters had to send out their stories by filing them at the Central Telephone and Telegraph Office on Gorky Street. In fact, it was common practice for the Soviet media themselves to stand by and actually take film footage of the foreign reporters clamoring to send out their stories for news events that would occur in Moscow. When I arrived at the Central Telegraph, there were Soviet film crews there waiting. I also found out that at uh, the uh, Moscow TV, all the scientists who usually commented on space uh, announcements were there waiting and uh, preparations were being made for programs to be altered. Now, the documents made available to me conclusively indicate that not only was Vladimir Lushin launched on April 7th, 1961, but that he seemed to have some severe problems during the flight. I'm not sure whether that was a failure of the guidance system. Uh, maybe he got a malfunctioning thruster causing the ship to spin uncontro uncontrollably, maybe causing uh, illusion to black out. But from my interpretation, he apparently missed the re-entry spot after the first orbit and came down after three orbits, either maybe by the people in mission control, maybe Aleutian re recovered uh, and maneuvered by manual control. The orbital dynamics of the Earth's rotation would have put Aleutian's re-entry in mainland China after three orbits. I tried to get comment from all the Soviet sources I could from the uh, press department, from Pravda, from Izvestia, from TASS. 
From all of them, I got the answer, we don't know. We don't know. But subsequently, I realized they did know. It was not even within the realm of possibility for the Soviet press to tell the truth about what happened to Colonel Ilyushin. The inept accounts about his whereabouts on April 7, 1961, were hilarious, as laughable as a sitcom. At first, they presented Colonel Ilyushin as having been a cosmonaut in training, but one who just didn't get to go up in space at that time. Next, the story evolved to where Colonel Ilyushin was never a cosmonaut trainee, and that he was fine, living in Moscow. After that, when the Kremlin was unable to produce Colonel Ilyushin in person for any news conferences, the story changed that he was a cosmonaut in training, but recently he'd been in a car accident and just couldn't have flown that day. The, the confused stories about Ilyushin simply demonstrate the point that I made several times, that the Soviet Union was its own worst enemy, that talk of Soviet propaganda being efficient, effective, is just nonsense. I don't believe, I never believed, that the story that Soviet, Soviet Union was good at propaganda. It was not. The regime's whole purpose in being was to preserve itself and to preserve the ideological basis that justified the Communist Party's control of Soviet society. And if you're sitting in a meeting and you're told that the most significant public personality in science has been injured, and the most significant technology that we will win the Cold War with failed, you have no choice but to cover it up and move on to the next potential victim, which happened to have been Gagarin. But I don't think there was much debate. I don't think the question even came up, should we tell the truth? The propagandists finally came up with what seemed to be the least believable and least tenable explanation for Colonel Ilyushin's whereabouts, an outright and ludicrous fabrication but it is one that's lasted up until this very day. As all test pilot, he liked to drive fast. And so he had the car accident. It was, I think it was uh, half an hour before, half an year before the Gagarin flight. When he recovered, and acupuncture at that time was not well-known Soviet Union, they sent him to China. Even the relations were not very good. The propagandists want us to believe that Colonel Ilyushin was in a major car accident in October of 1960, and that he was very badly injured. Well then, what was he doing in a photograph looking hale and hearty, taken in December of 1960, accepting his Hero of the Soviet Union Award from Leonid Brezhnev himself? In addition, the Soviet-style spin doctors would also have us believe that the Soviet leaders felt that their own Russian medical facilities were so inadequate and that the Soviet military hierarchy had so much respect for Chinese medical facilities and for Chinese acupuncture therapy that they sent their most highly decorated military officer, the son of one of their most powerful and famous aviation designers, to mainland China for treatment, even though both countries were practically on the verge of war with each other back in the early 1960s. When we talk about geopolitical understanding of the world, it was big differences between Soviet Union and China. And Mao Zedong, he has some cannibalistic philosophy, and he that pushed my father in 1958 when they met in Beijing, then we must have fear of the nuclear war. Let's give Americans attack us, and the, even that they will kill 300 million Chinese, it still be enough people to take over. And my father told, how can you tell this? What does this mean that they will kill millions of the Soviet people that want to stay alive? So through this, it was beginning of the hostility that grew up from 1958 and in the 1961, 
relations between two countries, Soviet Union and China, was very, how to say, cool. I find the story of Ilyushin's trip to China incomprehensible, and I've never heard a satisfactory explanation. I never heard of anybody being sent from the Soviet Union to China for medical treatment. And the second point was that, of course, in towards the end of the 50s and in the early 60s, Soviet-Chinese relations were very strained. And I really couldn't conceive that uh, someone like Ilushin uh, would, would be sent there. I find it difficult to understand. Amidst all the confusion and controversy swirling around Colonel Ilyushin's aborted mission, or car accident, and during a time when some began whispering about claims of cover-ups and conspiracies, young Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin was secretly and hurriedly named to be the first man in space. This was on the very next day after Colonel Ilyushin's failed flight. There was a highly secretive closed-door meeting with top military officials, told at the last minute to gather. Oddly, immediately the next day, which was on a Saturday, April 8, 1961. Allow me to assure the Soviet government, Communist Party, and people that I'll carry out with honor the task entrusted to me and that I'll be able to overcome all difficulties I may encounter the way a communist should. Furthermore, perhaps a pure coincidence? It was on that same day that Khrushchev hurriedly left Moscow for an unplanned vacation retreat. It was uh, April 8. He left to the Abkhazia. It was the, they have the state residence of the Pitsunda Peninsula. And with his uh, assistance and so-called so editorial groups that work with him on these speeches. Isn't it remarkable? Young Yuri Gagarin rapidly put into position to be launched into space on April 12, 1961, just four days after being selected. The timing is perhaps most unusual, to say the least, since cosmonauts had always been selected several weeks or even months prior to any flight and every single subsequent mission up to the present. Yuri Gagarin's surprise launch was quickly calendared for that Wednesday. Lieutenant Gagarin was to make one orbit. Furthermore, and almost too peculiar to believe, at 10 a.m. the Soviet media began what they claimed was to be the first ever live broadcast interview from outer space. The broadcast declared that the mission was well underway, that Gagarin was speaking live from the console of the spaceship. That I heard the broadcast about Gagarin's flight at about two or three minutes, or t about 10 o'clock on the Wednesday morning, Moscow time, the announcement that Gagarin had not only been launched, but that he was still up there. In comes my eldest son's wife and says, why aren't you listening to the radio? I saw that she was crying. 
Yuri is in outer space. Oh, what's he done? He's got two little children. I know that the idea that Illusion had been in orbit, which was the heart of my story, I realized probably on the next day or two days later was impossible. It couldn't have happened like that. Because if he had been in orbit, it would have been detected. And nobody has ever claimed that it was. Nobody. Because you could not put a man into orbit on a large satellite relaying on three different frequencies, at least three different frequencies, and it not be detected. Now that argument, that line of thought about Gagarin being up in space first because no other government admitted ever tracking an earlier flight, and the Soviets always denied an earlier flight, may have been valid in Cold War days. Or that is, up until now, until this very moment. With the introduction of the space race and the evolution of space as the new frontier for the Cold War between the United States and the USSR, the American Air Force and the CIA had predicted a Soviet manned launching. They had spent months quietly developing a number of top secret rocket and missile tracking stations at various isolated parts of the world to essentially monitor the Soviet space technology. Perhaps the most secretive, most remote, and highest value of all the tracking stations was the one located at Turn Island in the Pacific Ocean. Turn Island. It was perfectly situated due to the Earth's rotation, squarely in line with the orbital dynamics of any Soviet rocket launch. Not much is available in the literature about what was going on at Turn Island uh, in the, in the early 19, uh, late 1950s, early 1960s. But I can uh, tell you that I know there was an Air Force uh, a mobile tracking station on Turn Island. Now, Turn Island is in the French Frigate Shoals. Uh, it's way north northwest of Oahu. Uh, ba basically, it's part of the Hawaiian Islands, but, but way out there. And uh, essentially, all it amounts to is a, is a coral reef. There's not, not much else there. By early 1961, the CIA and the U.S. Air Force knew that the Soviets were going to try a manned mission by March or April. They added even more tracking gear and personnel at Turn Island to monitor and detect any manned missions. There was, a, there was one observer who was using 25 power binoculars as it came over the horizon uh, at, at night in the dark and uh, was able to cue uh, one of the tracking cameras. That tracking camera had, in, in addition to optics, had the ability to, to hone in on radio signals. And so they, uh, the technicians on Turn Island uh, were fiddling with the dials and, and adjusting the megahertz and finally tuned in to the right frequency so they were able, before the satellite passed beyond view, uh, to pick up Yuri Gagarin's heartbeat and to monitor that just as, as the Russians had been doing. During the 90-minute single orbit of Gagarin, he barely had any extra time to jot down notes, record a log, or make even cursory observations. The flight was fully automated. Gagarin was supposed to just be present and sit there. In fact, the spacecraft's controls were locked to prevent him from taking control of the ship. However, after retrofire, the service module unintentionally remained attached to the re-entry capsule by its wire bundle instead of breaking off and detaching. The incorrectly coupled spacecraft went through wild gyrations at the beginning of re-entry. Gagarin must have thought that the mission was about to fail before, finally, the wires at last burned through and properly detached. At about 10,000 feet, Gagarin ejected after atmospheric re-entry and descended under his own parachute as was designed. 
What the Soviets cared most about at that time was if Gagarin was still standing so he could then be presented to the world as the returning, conquering hero of the great Soviet socialist empire and the Marxist-Leninist way of life, unlike Colonel Ilyushin. One of the things I saw in the archive were the reports about Gagarin's near catastrophe during his flight. My guess is that that was a whole lot easier for them to cover. Any damage that he experienced, any damage the craft experienced, any near catastrophe, the end result was all they sought. The process of getting from liftoff to recovery was irrelevant as long as he could be put in front of a camera. Even though the space race concept itself was initiated and fueled by Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, he was strangely not even aware that the choice had been made to appoint Gagarin as a cosmonaut. Nor was he told the launch date. Although this event was to be hailed as the greatest single triumph of the communist regime, Khrushchev was kept completely in the dark about it all. Some Soviet experts now believe that Khrushchev was so overwrought and disturbed by Ilyushin's failure that he had to be sent away on vacation, and that Korolyov took advantage of the timing to take things into his own hands to launch Gagarin. So when they launch the cosmonaut, and then the, and the Karolyov call Khrushchev, and the Khrushchev shout on the, on the telephone, Levan, tell him, is he alive? Is he alive? And he didn't have the signal. And then they received the signal and they told, yes, he is alive. Khrushchev told, I want to speak with him. So they found the Gagarin somewhere near the Volga River in the field. And they brought him to a local telephone. He spoke with Khrushchev. He received his congratulations. It now turns out that it would not have been possible to speak live from space at 10 a.m. about all the details of the trip if he'd been launched at 9.08 that morning and tracked by the Turn Island tracking station at the time those engineers reported the flight. Nikita Khrushchev's son even admitted in one of his books that the Soviets lied about that fact, acknowledging that Gagarin was not up in space talking during his mission after all, and Gagarin was already on the ground when news went out about his flight. But it was reported that way to maximize the drama of the moment. When we talk about the information, in Soviet Union and Russia, they never announce until they knew that it is ended. In this case, at the space launch, it was no announcement during the flight. The cornerstone of their ideological presentation to the world, that the only way that they could convincingly say that they had a better system was by proving in a scientific manner that this was possible. And so if they had to remake the reality of the Aleutian disaster and remake it as the triumph of Gagarin, that's just what has to happen. That's, that's the reality that has to be reshaped. And the reshaping of the reality is, is no, there's no qualms. If it involves lies, cheating, stealing, this is the scientific mission of communism, to reshape reality as a new social order and a new human being will arise. It was all justified. An aspect which Khrushchev made a great deal of in very many speeches that uh, the successes of the Soviet space program and the launching of Gagarin in particular um, bore witness to the success of socialism and to the achievements of socialism that uh, as he once said, socialism was the launching pad for the Soviet space program. And even when, after the first introduction in the airport in Vnukovo, they came to this 
Zeal open uh, lima that usually used in the parades by the military commander. And my father told it to Gagarin and his wife, it's your day, it's not my day. You have to drive there alone. And Gagarin dragged him in the car. So Gagarin was like a host at him in the car, but still they're standing and my father sitting in the back. So it make this celebration really the celebration much bigger even the Sputnik. The general public reaction was one of tremendous enthusiasm, spontaneous enthusiasm, uh, with uh, you know crowds. Whereas when uh, Gagarin drove in with Khrushchev from Knukovar Airport, I mean the streets were indeed lined with thousands of people who were absolutely enthusiastic, with homemade posters and banners and goodness knows what. They, they, it, they were really swept away. The Soviets were now on top of the biggest story of the century. They had their handsome, youthful, enthusiastic member of the Communist Party, one who they could present to the world as the conquering hero of the Soviet Socialist Empire. Gagarin may have been, at least at first, a willing participant, but he must also have started to figure out by then that their plan would be for him to spend the rest of his years as a fraud. After all, to party members, it was the court of international opinion on communist perception that came first, far above any individual's needs or wants. The Soviets cleanly excised evidence of Ilyushin's flight exactly like they did for the Nidellen rocket disaster, and all other failures of any space agency program or cosmonaut trainee dropout. The Ilyushin story began to lose traction. It was ultimately forgotten, to be relegated to the garbage can of hoaxes and fantasies, just as the propagandists would have history and the world all believe. These rumors that Gagarin was not a space originated the same way as they originated rumors that Americans never flew to the moon. You have these people. So you cannot do anything with all these things. It's UFO, it is Americans did not fly to the moon, it's Gagarin was not the first, it was Loch Ness, Bigfoot, all these stories are the same. To account for Ilyushin's flight, the Soviets just claimed that they had sent up a crash test dummy that had electrodes attached to its body, saying it was used for an unmanned mission as a safety precaution, just a precursor to Gagarin's flight. And then it was rumors appeared because before the Gagarin, they sent the, the dummy, the name Ivan Ivanovich, and they have their tape recorded testing the radio transmitter but it was everything secret. Then the Savannah Avanche safely landed, and then appeared this uh, damaged illusion in China. Unfortunately for the propagandists, the U.S. Air Force tracking station facility at Turn Island was able to clearly pick up a heartbeat, that of a human occupant detected and tracked in real time and it was consistent with that of a person in extreme danger. In addition, the tracking station engineer witnessed firsthand with his own ears communication in Russian that was clearly the voice of a person in distress, a man shouting frantically in dire trouble between the voice from the capsule and what were Soviet tracking ships at sea. As for Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin himself, he quietly showed up at his Moscow apartment about 11 months later, after the so-called year-long acupuncture treatments for car accident injuries. He inconspicuously went back to work for the Sukhoi Jet Manufacturing Company as their chief test pilot and design engineer. In fact, he was even promoted to general though now he's retired. And what of Yuri Gagarin? Khrushchev's government sent Gagarin on tour to at least 20 to 30 countries per year. Publicly, he was revered in every country, and he drew thousands upon thousands of onlookers to each event, 
and each speech he ever presented. Songs were written to put his praises to music. Textbooks were commissioned to go to print. School children were taught about Soviet native son Yuri Gagarin. His smiling picture was hung up everywhere. He was now the greatest icon in the communist empire, the symbol of Soviet socialist conquest over the Western democratic technology. Privately, however, his secret life was a different story. In one instance, Gagarin was caught in bed with a young girl in a hotel room in late 1961, and she later claimed he was in the process of raping her. He was just after his flight. He was a great hero, and all these girls want, wanted him. And he was in one of the resort area. One of these girls just pulled him, and uh, she wanted him. And I think uh, that he did not resist. If we talk raping, I will more say that she raped him, that he raped her. <laughs> Gagarin panicked once his wife showed up unexpectedly. Gagarin, without pants, jumped out of the window trying to escape from the third story, and he nearly fractured his skull in the process. Living the life of a lie, Gagarin was also showing signs of severe alcoholism and depression. The media spin doctors were busy, too, their lives in a state of denial, trying hard to conjure up stories to offer explanations for Yuri Gagarin's increasingly peculiar behavior. And I never thought that Gagarin was alcoholic, no. It's very easy to begin, became alcoholic be, without any intention. If you have such strong social pressure to drink every day, it's Russian culture. You cannot refuse drinking like here. And we are asking what you want to drink. In Russia, you cannot answer water or soft drink. You have to say, yes, I will drink cognac or I will drink vodka. Even they will not like if you will say, I will drink wine. Furthermore, the government grounded Gagarin absolutely prevented him from flying jets or going back into space, not allowing him to do anything dangerous since the government's most prized possession had to be protected at all costs. Perhaps Gagarin's knowing he was a fraud, living a lie, combined with his entanglement in the Soviet PR machinery, and then being told he's denied the green light to ever fly again, all this started to really wear on Gagarin's psyche. On the popular level, he became a symbol of the Soviet Union, and nobody wants to have that symbol. And the space travel, like any testing, test piloting, it is a very dangerous profession. So if you survive first flight, don't want to risk him sending them in space second time. Until mid-1964, Khrushchev's position as party leader was still secure and Gagarin was forced by the Communist Party to continue his goodwill tours worldwide, promoting the ideals of the socialist way. However, the Soviet Union's mounting economic problems increased the pressure on Khrushchev's leadership. On October 14, 1964, while Khrushchev was away on holiday in the Crimea, there was a bloodless coup. His protege, Leonid Brezhnev, took over and became the Russian Communist Party's first secretary with the support and approval of the military. For Khrushchev, space was his favorite baby. Khrushchev absolutely loved the cosmos and everything related to it. This is why the rocket forces were so popular. When Brezhnev took over, this did not interest him at all, and everything was left to fate and the rocket forces slowly started to deteriorate. In Russia, it is a tradition that the new president must blame everything that went wrong in the country on the president before him, and this is exactly what Brezhnev did. He started to cut off financing for many projects, including the rocket forces and space exploration, and there was no space launch in over two years. This is why everything started to deteriorate after Khrushchev. As soon as Brezhnev became leader, Gagarin was abruptly frowned upon by the new regime, especially because he was seen by them as a symbol of a Khrushchev accomplishment. And I never heard that Gagarin 
belong to the Brezhnev inner circle. I never heard that Gagarin was invited to the Brezhnev dinners at Brezhnev Hall. Very different, different, uh, how to say, layers of the society. When we talk about relations between Gagarin and the leadership, I will answer that it was no relations. In spite of the changing Soviet political landscape, Gagarin was still forced to make the rounds on tour up till 1965 to tout the superiority of the Soviet Empire. He was also spending less and less family time with his wife and two daughters. It was fairly well known that Brezhnev tolerated Gagarin because of his larger-than-life hero status, but uh, there was really no real bond between them in a way that there was between Gagarin and Khrushchev. Now, I've seen a report where uh, Gagarin has gone to Brezhnev's government to talk about the treatment of one of his friends, and uh, he was told, and I quote, you are a hero, so go and ponder on heroic things and leave the rest to us, unquote. Gagarin was rapidly approaching the limit that he could tolerate. At that point, the head of the space program, Sergei Korolyov, saw a need to step in. Korolyov promised Gagarin that he'd get him back on board a flight on the newly developed Soyuz spaceship scheduled for launch in 1967. However, on January 14, 1966, Sergei Korolyov went into a Moscow hospital for a routine minor surgical procedure. A malignant tumor was discovered, and Korolyov died on the operating table. With the death of Korolyov also went the promise to send Gagarin back into space. The new leaders ultimately decided to have Gagarin's best friend, Vladimir Komarov, fly on the maiden voyage of the new Soyuz instead. They did, however, give permission to Gagarin to be Komarov's backup. There was bad blood between Gagarin and Brezhnev. He was becoming more and more an outcast in Brezhnev's government. By early 1968, Gagarin wasn't welcome at government functions, even though he grudgingly attended them. I've seen at least three or four reports um, that describe Gagarin getting drunk at a government function early 1968 that he actually threw a glass of champagne in the face of Brezhnev. I could just imagine that if Gagarin was becoming so disrespectful of the Soviet leadership that Brezhnev would have gone to the head of the KGB, told him that, hey, enough is enough, it's time to make Gagarin something other than a live embarrassment. I do believe that this scenario did happen. This is because Gagarin, during his last months, I, I personally noticed that he was very unsettled and troubled. And anything could have happened if he was intoxicated, especially if it was at some government banquet. In a last-ditch effort to keep Gagarin feeling like he was connected with the cosmonaut corps, as he always wanted, he was appointed as the deputy training director in Star City. This was a desk-bound, paper-pushing job, and Gagarin hated it, even though he turned down more prestigious positions elsewhere in the military. Then suddenly, Gagarin was sent an extremely odd message. He's allowed to fly in a jet again and allowed to re-qualify as a fighter jet pilot. At the same time, there was never any explanation whatsoever for why the government would all of a sudden allow their icon, the greatest hero in Soviet history, to start taking risks and to endanger his life and his status. It was reported that during this so-called routine flight, the jet experienced engine failure, spiraled to the ground, and crashed. The reports went on to say that Gagarin was killed along with his co-pilot. Why was there no Mayday call? And why could neither he nor his co-pilot eject out when the jet experienced the engine failure? He just goes up, the jet crashes, and he dies? Oh, but this story gets a whole lot better. And with the KGB's and Brezhnev's fingerprints smeared all over the place, too. In an even more ironic twist, the Soviet Air Force immediately dispatched none other than General Vladimir Ilyushin to the crash site to head the crash investigation committee. 
General Ilyushin was to be assisted by both cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, who was the first man to conduct a spacewalk in 1965, and Stefan Mikoyan, the son of the aviation designer of MiG fighter jets. General Ilyushin himself personally told the producers of this documentary, and in no uncertain terms, that Gagarin's body was simply never found. The accident investigation at the crash site found both seats intact among the badly mangled fuselage, and the charred remains of what was the co-pilot still strapped in the back seat, but no sign of Gagarin at all. There can be several variations to explain this. For one thing, maybe he never even flew in the jet, and that is why his body was never found. In Russia, everything is possible. Of course, you can't rule out that he might just be alive and in a psychiatric hospital or even a jail up to this day. They needed to get rid of him, so they did it. General Ilyushin said that someone thought that the charred remains of a pinky finger at the crash site could have been Gagarin's. Leonov was reported as saying that he only found some cloth and leather that may have been bits and pieces of a flight jacket, like one that might have belonged to Gagarin. The accident investigation report prepared by General Vladimir Lushin and Alexei Leonov has to this day been kept top secret and has never been made public. However, the KGB came out with their own report that was made public. Uh, got it here, and I quote, the KGB investigation reported no conspiracy, no hostile actions, and no deliberate sabotage, even from abroad." End quote. But uh, the accident investigation report was secret, like all these accident investigation reports in the Soviet Union. This report was not published not because they kept some secrets, but because of the procedure. So this report was, and is, to be kept sealed forever secret because of mere procedures, the propagandists say, and not because there was anything to cover up. The actual tangible remains of the jet and any remains purportedly found in the jet were all meticulously collected by the KGB and are still stored in dozens of 30-gallon drums that are, to this day, kept under lock and key in a heavily guarded Russian warehouse in a military facility. Furthermore, the remains of the jet were never inspected by any independent investigation committee other than the Ilyushin, Leonov, and Mikoyan team when they were called in just after the crash. Now, another suspicious point is that when Alexei Leonov demanded to inspect the accident report 20 years later for another documentary film on the Gagarin crash, Leonov found that his own comments on the report were changed. Uh, his name was forged by someone else. When the KGB was uh, confronted with this, their response was, and I quote, it is clear that some people were adjusting the facts in order to protect their own positions, end quote. I mean, this is probably one of the biggest cover-ups and conspiracies in history. I've reached the point in thinking about what the Soviet Union managed to pull off in the way of lies to the outside world or lies to its own citizens or lies to itself, not to be surprised that something like that might have occurred. My only conclusion, though, would be we'd have to figure out, I guess as a preceding question, did Gagarin die a genuine accident or was he killed? If he was killed, it probably was because they didn't want somebody telling the story or being undisciplined about it. Uh, unfortunately, we may never know whether he died of an accident or of a, of a murder. When the government decided that the funeral for Gagarin was to go ahead regardless of where Gagarin's body was, General Ilyushin told the producers of this documentary that he actually questioned government dignitaries on why they would do so. The KGB then told him outright that it would be best if he were to remain silent on this matter. But when you talk about death of Gagarin, of course it was personal tragedy, it was national tragedy, it was world tragedy, because we lost the man in his young age when he was a hero. 
But from the other side, it is leaving uh, his image for the history. Maybe it was more in his interest that he leaving this young, smiling person. But it was tragedy to all of us. It was a big tragedy to my father. In my mind, one of the most perplexing questions about this whole affair is why would Ilushin, you know, why would his fellow cosmonauts, the, the Russian, Chinese, the U.S. governments, I mean, why would they want to remain quiet on this for so many years? I mean, the, the answer on an individual level is clearly that Ilushin and his colleagues have been heavily subsidized by their government. I mean, they're high-ranking military officials. Um, they're heroes, and they just don't want to make waves. Now, on a governmental level, it's just that they just don't want their people to be asking, you know, what else has been kept secret? How else have we been lied to? I think that fearing the KGB will continue for a long time, even though this type of organization does not officially exist anymore, but the main infrastructure of this organization still exists today, which will keep people quiet. Of course, everyone knows that everything in Russia is still under control of the KGB to this day, or now known as FSB. This fear of people telling the truth about their past will carry on for many generations. The tremendous emphasis you place on secrecy. Yes, the Soviet Union was secretive, but so also was the United States. Is so also is the United States. Every society has its secrets. Soviet society had more secrets than other societies, yes. But it is not alone in having secrets. And if you are really good at your Marxist-Leninist theory, then nothing in the real world should be less than perfect. And so there were two types of secrecy. There was the secrecy that prevented them from telling their own citizens and by that fact the rest of the world. But there was the secrecy internally governments within the government that would essentially prevent various layers of decision-making and power and authority from knowing what had taken place. It had a dramatically distorting effect on, on the Soviet Union, which is one reason why it collapsed. Maybe a big reason why it collapsed. In any event, even though the Soviet Union imploded under the weight of its own lies, deceit, and secrecy, Yuri Gagarin will remain a larger-than-life legend to a public who knew him for what they were told he was. So there you have it. The short, sad, uncensored, and until now, untold life and presumed death of Yuri Gagarin. What the history books do not include is this, that Yuri Gagarin became a prisoner and victim of a system, a corrupt system built on lies and deceit, but one that made him famous. He got entangled in a web of propaganda and the need to strictly follow the path of Marxist-Leninist philosophy. It is not known whether the U.S. government will ever choose to release those Air Force tracking station recordings and documents and other evidence of Vladimir Ilyushin's flight before Gagarin or if the Russians will ever release their secret accounts and reveal the truth about Ilyushin's flight, as well as all of the other cosmonaut and rocket accidents, or if General Ilyushin and the other cosmonauts still alive, in the know, will ultimately come forward to tell the truth, or whether the Russian government will ever release Ilyushin's and Leonov's crash investigation report or even if the communist Chinese government will ever release their records of Ilyushin's crash landing and reveal the details of his stay in China. Vladimir Komarov and the new Soyuz rocket were launched in the pre-dawn hours of April 23, 1967.
The Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, was personally putting tremendous pressure on everyone at the space agency to launch this new Soyuz spacecraft in time for the 50th anniversary of the Communist Revolution celebration. Posters were readied for schools and government offices, showing Komarov in his crisp military uniform with his shiny medals. However, the guidance system shorted out. The solar panels failed to deploy properly, and Komarov's capsule was losing electrical power and going out of control as a result. Komarov's capsule hit the Earth at 600 miles an hour, exploding and almost disintegrating on impact. There was no hope for Komarov's survival. Recent developments and brand new declassified evidence now clearly show that there's much, much more than meets the public eye about the secret life and death of Colonel Vladimir Komarov. Ever since the beginning of the space race, accidents and failures and human errors were never ever admitted in the Soviet Union. When they did occur, they were completely covered up erased from existence by the propaganda machine of the totalitarian Soviet regime. Perhaps the most outrageous, egregious cover-up of the era was when a brand new ICBM was about to be tested. It was the command of strategic rocket forces, Marshal Nindelin, who feeling that you can do everything. So he uh, bring his chair and he sat under the uh, rocket that was uh, at that time filled with full oxidizer and sitting there. So all other people gathering around, it was hundreds of people. They started the engine on the second stage. It is burned the first stage and it is 160 ton of this oxidizer fuel. Just it was like waterfall, oxidizer fall on top of all these people. It was like a hell because they burned alive. From the Martian Nidellen, they found only his keys from his safe. No one ever knew about this disaster, which killed not only Nidellen, head of the rocket strategic forces, but also over 165 military officers and technicians. The Soviet propagandists only allowed the newspapers to publish this one short communique on October 26, 1960, bylined from the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which said, quote, Marshal Nedelin died in an airplane crash, end quote. It was many such spectacular failures in the Soviet lunches. Russia all the time kept their secrecy. It is part of the national mentality and part of the philosophy. So it was something between mentality and KGB logic. It just they don't like to expose all the things. Uh, and it, as it was no uh, democracy, it was no independent media, so no, nobody can make this uh, discovery. Cosmonaut training was conducted under the absolute strictest veil of secrecy in a city specifically built for their living and training, off limits to any non-military personnel. Many of the cosmonaut trainees were not necessarily from the Air Force Academy, and it wasn't only test pilots that became cosmonaut trainees. For example, Yuri Gagarin was not a test pilot at all. He was just a young pilot chosen from an air squadron in a remote base in the north with only a few hours of flight time. On the other hand, there were also some well-established test pilots chosen to be in the cosmonaut corps that were all highly regarded like Vladimir Komarov. Any trainees who dropped out or who died during training were erased from existence, literally. Airbrushed out of photographs and any evidence of them destroyed, just like those victims of the Nedelin disaster. Not even parents, wives, or children were allowed to be aware of what their son or husband or father was doing. 
It's been well over 50 years since the beginnings of the space race and the secrecy behind all the cosmonaut training and the efforts to get them into space. Uh, I find it fascinating that just recently the newspaper Pravda, the quasi-official media outlet of the Russian government, admitted for the very first time that three cosmonauts, Ladovsky, Shaborin, and Mitkov, that they were killed in early efforts to get into space on the uh, suborbital flights and that their names as heroes should now be recognized. That was an amazing revelation, but it does beg the question, what else has the government and the space agency kept secret, and what other lies have they told us over the years? When the word went out that pilots were sought for the dangerous venture of space travel, by far the best and most famous Soviet test pilot of that era was Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin. In December of 1960, Colonel Vladimir Ilyushin was even awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal, the highest Soviet award, equal to America's Congressional Medal of Honor. Vladimir Ilyushin was a test pilot, one of the uh, best test pilots of, the, of his generation. He was son of the famous Russian aircraft designer Sergei Ilyushin, who designed the Illusion 2, the combat plane, and named Sturmavik, the Second World War, and then uh, the many passenger plane, Illusion Bombers. In Russia, there's a group of families who are significant historically, and the Illusions were certainly one of those. And, um, the fact that it was all in the same sphere in aviation and aerospace sciences was significant. Um, it was therefore, in my view, no accident that Vladimir Lushin would have been picked as the man for the job. I mean, it was an obvious choice. Uh, he was the right age. Uh, he had the right training. He had the name. I had seen photograph of, of Vladimir Ilyushin wearing space gear and referred to as a member of the, uh, the cosmonaut group, training for cosmonaut. Therefore, when I heard the story that Vladimir Ilyushin had been up in space, it fitted. The documents made available to me from the CIA and the U.S. Air Force tracking station Turn Island in the Pacific, they conclusively seem to indicate that not only was Vladimir Lushin launched on April 7, 1961, but he seems to have had severe problems during that flight. Now, I'm not sure whether there was a, uh, a failure of the guidance system or perhaps a malfunctioning thruster causing the ship to spin uncontrollably and maybe causing Lucian to black out, but from my interpretation of the data, he apparently missed the re-entry spot after the first orbit. Uh, seems to have come down after three orbits. The orbital dynamics of the Earth's rotation would have put Lucian's re-entry in mainland China after three orbits. It was not even within the realm of possibility for the Soviet press to tell the truth about what happened to Colonel Ilyushin. The inept accounts about his whereabouts on April 7, 1961, were hilarious, as laughable as a sitcom. The Soviet Union was its own worst enemy as regards propaganda. I don't believe, I never believed, that the story of the Soviet 
the Soviet Union was good at propaganda. It was not. The, the confused stories about illusion simply demonstrate the point that I made several times that the Soviet Union was its own worst enemy. That talk of Soviet propaganda being efficient, effective, is just nonsense. At that time, in the beginning of the 1960s, it was very possible to cover up just about anything, including a rocket launch, because the propaganda was everywhere and all media was strictly controlled by the Kremlin. Everything that wasn't official was completely covered up. Launches at the time and flights could easily have been covered up and were covered up when they failed. For Russia, it was not a problem at all to cover something up. Amidst all the confusion and controversy swirling around Colonel Ilyushin's aborted mission, and during a time when some began whispering about claims of cover-ups and conspiracies, young Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin was secretly and hurriedly named to be the first man in space. <laughs> It's difficult to single out any one of six splendidly trained astronauts, but that must be done. The Air Force Command recommends Senior Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin for the first space flight, and it has decided to appoint Herman Titov as backup pilot. This was on the very next day after Colonel Ilyushin's failed flight. There was a highly secretive closed-door meeting with top military officials, told at the last minute to gather. Oddly, immediately the next day, which was on a Saturday, April 8, 1961. Allow me to assure the Soviet government, Communist Party, and people that I'll carry out with honor the task entrusted to me, and that I'll be able to overcome all difficulties I may encounter the way a communist should. Very suspiciously, only four days after being officially named the, uh, the next first man in space by the Soviet space officials on April 12, 1961, the strictly controlled Soviet media reported the successful launch, orbit, and re-entry of the first man in space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Although there still remains some doubts as to whether he actually flew the mission and whether he had already returned to Earth before the media broadcast the information about his flight, in any event, he was immediately brought to Moscow, paraded in front of huge cheering crowds as a returning conquering hero of the Soviet Empire, demonstrating the superior technology of communism over Western capitalist societies. The Soviets were now on top of the biggest story of the century. They had their handsome, youthful, enthusiastic member of the Communist Party, one who they could present to the world as the conquering hero of the Soviet Socialist Empire. The general public reaction was one of tremendous enthusiasm, spontaneous enthusiasm, uh, with uh, crowds as when uh, Gagarin drove in with Khrushchev from Nukovar Airport. The streets were indeed lined with thousands of people who were absolutely enthusiastic, homemade posters and banners and goodness knows what. They were really swept away. I would say that Gagarin uh, became the icon of my father's achievements. He was became the representative of the Soviet Union with his nice smile and his, the face. And you have this idol in the countries all the time. It was like uh, Elvis Presley to the United States later. You cannot pick them and say, you will be the icon. People have to pick them and say, you are the icon. Gagarin may have been, at least at first, a willing participant. 
but he must also have started to figure out by then that their plan would be for him to spend the rest of his years as a fraud. After all, to party members, it was the communist society, communist government and court of international opinion on communist perception that came first, far above any individual's needs or wants. Living the life of a lie, Gagarin was also showing signs of severe alcoholism and depression, mood swings worsening throughout his travels during these busy years. The media spin doctors were busy too, their lives in a state of denial, trying hard to conjure up stories to offer explanations for Yuri Gagarin's increasingly peculiar behavior. Furthermore, the government grounded Gagarin absolutely prevented him from flying jets or going back into space, not allowing him to do anything dangerous, since the government's most prized possession had to be protected at all costs. Perhaps Gagarin's knowing he was a fraud, living a lie, combined with his entanglement in the Soviet PR machinery, and then being told he's denied the green light to ever fly again, all this started to really wear on Gagarin's psyche. Until mid-1964, Khrushchev's position as party leader was still secure, and Gagarin was forced by the Communist Party to continue his goodwill tours worldwide, promoting the ideals of the socialist way. However, the Soviet Union's mounting economic problems increased the pressure on Khrushchev's leadership. And Khrushchev's administration was also continuing to spend an increasingly untenable amount of money funding the space race, instead of modernizing the conventional military forces. On October 14, 1964, while Khrushchev was away on holiday in the Crimea, there was a bloodless coup. His protege, Leonid Brezhnev, took over and became the Russian Communist Party's first secretary with the support and approval of the military. An interesting subplot to all these political dynamics going on at the time in the Soviet Union was on October 12, 1964. The USSR launched the world's first multi-man spacecraft, Voskhod 1. It was the first to carry three people into space, uh, commanded by Yuri Gagarin's best friend, Colonel Vladimir Komarov. Now, this was a highly dangerous modification to the capsule and considered uh, as a very risky stunt back then in order to upstage the American space flights. Because all three men could not wear spacesuits in the cramped capsule, and there was no ejection seats or escape tower. The bravery and heroism of these three men to go into space without spacesuits and taking all kinds of risks certainly uh, is unheard of these days. And they was launched and greeted by Khrushchev, and then the Khrushchev talked with them by telephone. But when they returned to the Earth, uh, they was met with the new leadership. And they have the joke, the usually they reported to Khrushchev and told in future will fulfill orders of the Soviet government. And now they joke that they report, we will fulfill any orders of any Soviet government. As soon as Brezhnev became leader, he developed an increasingly conservative and regressive attitude, especially towards Yuri Gagarin, who found he was suddenly given the cold shoulder. Gagarin was abruptly frowned upon by the new regime, especially because he was seen by them as a symbol of a Khrushchev accomplishment. Gagarin was rapidly approaching the limit that he could tolerate, of having his entire life under governmental control. He was ready to quit the cosmonaut corps and the Air Force and take his chances doing anything else. Gagarin's public overuse of alcohol, visible depression and mood swings were getting more and more noticeable and more difficult to control. At that point, the head of the space program, Sergei Korolyov, saw a need to step in. 
Korolev promised Gagarin that he'd get him back on board a flight, that he'd use every ounce of his power to make sure Gagarin got another chance to go back into space on the newly developed Soyuz spaceship scheduled for launch in 1967. However, on January 14, 1966, Sergei Korolev went into a Moscow hospital for a routine minor surgical procedure. A malignant tumor was discovered, and Korolev died on the operating table. With the death of Korolev also went the promise to send Gagarin back into space. Korolev had never groomed a protege nor did he have any candidates for a strong-willed successor who could easily take over for him. The new leaders ultimately decided to have Gagarin's best friend, Vladimir Komarov, fly on the maiden voyage of the new Soyuz instead. They did, however, give permission to Gagarin to be Komarov's backup. Let's say when we're talking about Gagarin and the Soyuz and the Kamarov, they were very different people. Kamarov was a much more experienced person, and I think he was much older than Gagarin. But his, his personal friends, with whom he went hunting, or went to watch the soccer game, or hockey, or have the party. There seems to be no question from the documents I've seen that Yuri Gagarin and Vladimir Komarov were the absolute best of friends and really did love each other like brothers. I'm quite sure that Gagarin saw Komarov as the proverbial big brother he never had. I'm also sure that no one in the space agency in the post korolev era had the guts to let Gagarin risk his life on another space mission, but that putting these two cosmonauts together on this maiden flight of the Soyuz was the next best scenario. Everybody already knew that Gagarin was grounded, never to fly again. But this was a way to keep him thinking he was active in the cosmonaut corps, at least for the time being. Since this was to be the maiden flight of the first newly designed rocket in the post korolev era, the space agency set up a highly complex mission involving two Soyuz spacecraft being sent up at roughly the same time and involving a total of four cosmonauts, along with a double spacewalk and transfer of cosmonauts from one ship to the other. Gagarin and Komarov demanded they be the ones to test and inspect every aspect of this new spacecraft and capsule. During their inspection, both Gagarin and Komarov found several design flaws with many of the switches and wiring, which would most certainly lead to a catastrophic failed mission if this problem occurred in space. The Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, was personally putting tremendous pressure on everyone at the space agency to launch this new Soyuz spacecraft in time for the 50th anniversary of the Communist Revolution celebration. This resulted in the space agency being either unable or unwilling to accept Gagarin's and Komarov's claim of design flaws and potential failures. Gagarin and Komarov even went so far as to write a personal letter to Brezhnev, appealing to him to not use the spacecraft, detailing its more than 200 problems and requesting that the flight be postponed. That letter was personally delivered to the Kremlin, but the letter mysteriously disappeared shortly afterwards. Once again, Gagarin stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the inflexible and impersonal Soviet machinery that cared less about saving the life of his best friend and more about the image of the great empire. Time was running out for Komarov, of the four unmanned test launches of the Soyuz before Komarov's flight, all four were failures, having exploded on the launch pad or shortly after launch. Therefore, 
Gagarin and Komarov came up with one last chance plan to stop the insanity of this mission. The strategy was to create a huge scandal in the space community, just two and a half days before Komarov's flight, during a meeting with Communist Party members, space agency dignitaries and official government-approved reporters and photographers in a news conference-style setting. It was a formality presenting cosmonauts to the officials in this setting and go through a few rounds of questions and answers. Both Gagarin and Komarov believed that if these people were to find out the truth about this badly planned mission, then surely they would put a stop to it and save not only Komarov's life, but the other cosmonauts in the second capsule as well. So it was decided by Gagarin and Komarov that during the meeting, Komarov would tell the truth about the mission, which he did. The audience was expecting simple routine statements, but instead saw Komarov stand up and bluntly warn about several design flaws, how the spaceship was not at all ready for launch, and that the flight would be a suicide mission if he flew on schedule. The audience, completely shocked, was totally taken by surprise at Komarov's brutal honesty. However, rather than the officials expressing sympathy for Komarov's cause and demanding an investigation, there was complete silence. Then one of the leading Communist Party officers stood up and told Komarov point blank that he was a coward, one not worthy of the uniform he was wearing. These were fighting words to a test pilot and cosmonaut hero like Vladimir Komarov. Both Gagarin and Komarov knew at that point that all was lost and that their last attempt to stop the madness had failed. Komarov looked up at all assembled and responded, quote, I am ready to fly at any time and on any day, end quote. For someone like Vladimir Komarov to have the guts to go into space without a spacesuit, then to be called a, a coward for not wanting to go on a suicide mission, that, that certainly must have put him over the top. I've seen a report where Komarov's friends admitted that Komarov laid out all the details of his impending flight and the dangers involved to his wife. Uh, the wife was reported to have told him to refuse to go. And his response was that if he refused to go, then Brezhnev would send Gagarin up in his place, and it would be him that would surely die. Komarov really thought that was unacceptable and felt that Gagarin needed protecting. Gagarin himself made several frantic last-minute appeals for a personal meeting with Brezhnev. He also placed several angry calls to Kremlin officials, but all his meeting requests were refused. Brezhnev wanted the new spaceship launched on April 23, 1967, and no one was willing or able to stand up to Leonid Brezhnev. Some years later, one of the technicians preparing Komarov on launch day told a reporter that Gagarin was becoming totally irrational in the preparation room about three or four hours before the launch where Komarov was suiting up, and that Gagarin was flailing his arms around, demanding a spacesuit, uh, demanding that he wasn't going to let Komarov go up by himself, insisting he was going to go up with Komarov by his side. From this report, Gagarin completely lost it, practically had to be restrained to let Komarov go up the gantry to the capsule. It must have been a really difficult situation for everybody at the time, especially Gagarin, to watch Komarov go on practically a suicide mission. Komarov and the new Soyuz rocket were launched in the pre-dawn hours of April 23, 1967. However, just as Gagarin and Komarov predicted, the equipment failures began almost immediately. The guidance system shorted out, the solar panels failed to deploy properly, and Komarov's capsule was losing electrical power and going out of control as a result.
These massive and immediate failures, at the very least, prevented the launching of the second Soyuz spacecraft, sparing those three cosmonauts. Komarov switched all systems to manual controls, and he was thus able to orient his capsule properly for re-entry in the very narrow entry corridor at the soonest possible opportunity, and to line up his re-entry thrusters to slow his speed. Gagarin had demanded to be the capsule communicator with Komarov in the mission control room, and so he was able to be with his best friend up until the final moments of re-entry. In reality, Komarov exhibited his superior test pilot talents in getting the Soyuz capsule under control and through the narrow re-entry corridor, but the batteries were exhausted by the time of re-entry and there was just no power left to deploy the parachutes to slow the capsule down. Komarov's capsule hit the Earth at 600 miles an hour, exploding and almost disintegrating on impact when the fuel for the re-entry thrusters ignited. There was no hope for Comrade's survival. Gagarin hopped on the next plane out to the landing site, which happened to be a cargo aircraft, to see for himself what had happened. Once there, he found a still smoldering crater filled with twisted and melted wreckage along with the burnt up bits and pieces of what was left of his best friend. Traumatized by what he had seen, Gagarin himself started to go through the wreckage, picking up the pieces of what was his best friend, and ordered as much of Komarov's earthly remains as could be readily located to be placed into a casket, and were immediately escorted back to Moscow by Gagarin and other military officers that same day. The strictly controlled Soviet media was in a complete quandary about covering Komarov's flight failure, especially since the launch itself was widely reported with great fanfare and publicity. This situation was thus unlike the Nadellan disaster that killed so many people, or Ilyushin's failed flight, or all the other ill-fated and tragic cosmonaut trainee accidents. Those missions were not reported live while in progress so they were reasonably easy to cover up, to destroy the evidence. However, in Komarov's case, reporters were live and the public was waiting near their TVs and radios to hear of the flight's progress since the early morning. But the Soviet news media totally ignored any mention of the flight for the whole rest of the day, almost as if there was never any flight at all. The whole of the press corps was absolutely on edge. Furthermore, Moscow was a mass of rumours. Moscow was always full of rumours about all kinds of things. But at this time, it was about space. And there were several different versions of the story. Uh, some of them were published in the West. We were constantly exchanging phone calls. Have you heard this? Have you heard that? And what do you think of it? Komarov's wife, Valentina, immediately knew that her husband was dead when she didn't hear anything on the radio or TV about her husband's flight, and also when she realized that the KGB cut off her telephone line during the day presumably to prevent her from hearing about his death until she was officially notified. A group of generals pulled up to her driveway later that day and gave her both good news and bad news. The good news, as told by the generals, was that her husband had heroically survived both the flight and landing, and the mission itself was a big success. But the bad news, was that he died in a hospital as a result of burns he sustained in a bus crash in the city of Sholkovo, just outside of Moscow, on the way back after the flight. 
That was how the Soviet media was preparing to report his death. The generals left Valentina with her husband's official death certificate as dictated by the Kremlin. This is the scientific mission of communism, to reshape reality as a new social order and a new human being will arise. And so the PR strategy was naturally going to fit that in. And, uh, you know, as I think more about it now, in thinking about the logic of the system as it confronts the bad news, it makes perfect sense that they would have reshaped the reality of it to suit their own needs and to project a different story to the world. It was all justified. The Soviet Union was useless at propaganda. There was never an accident. There was never a mishap. The picture was of perfection. But what the Soviet propagandists did not understand was that by presenting the difficulties, the problems, the mistakes, the accidents, the mishaps, they could have presented a far better picture of the Soviet Union than in fact they did. And, you know, show completely, a completely inept approach. Valentina immediately called up Yuri, who just returned from the crash site. She was in hysterics, asking him what to do with such a document since, as she was reported to have said, quote, except for the first and last name of my husband on this document, I'm sure not a single other word was true, end quote. Yuri, Valentina, да. Мне только что в доме были генералы. Они мне сказали, что они мне все они обманули. Все, что осталось, это вот это имя. Все обман. Все, что они сказали. The logic of the system was that everything presented to the outside world had to express the purity and perfection of Marxist-Leninist thinking. And this was, this was a fixation at the highest levels, and it permeated down. So everybody was willing to participate in lying as a national pastime, and lying to themselves, lying to their families, lying in their communities, lying to the outside world, because there was a greater purpose, which was that they, as the better system, had to win the Cold War. So when the Soviet propagandists tried to cover up Vladimir Komarov's flight exactly the way they tried to cover up the Nadellin disaster and exactly like they tried to cover up the Aleutian flight, it must have driven Gagarin over the edge and he just must have lost control. I mean, the guy was already traumatized over seeing his best friend getting smashed to pieces on an unnecessary suicide mission. But then to have it brushed under the carpet and, and uh, the world would be told that Komarov was killed in a bus crash, it was just it was too much for Gagarin to bear. I've seen recently declassified State Department and CIA reports referring to Gagarin storming into the Kremlin, uh, shouting, screaming, demanding to see Brezhnev, demanding the truth be told about Komarov. And he died a hero of the Soviet Union at the controls of a spaceship and not from some make-believe fire in a bus crash in Moscow. Gagarin apparently even threatened to go to the Western press himself if the Soviet media didn't immediately acknowledge Komarov's heroic death and that it had nothing to do with the Marxist-Leninist communist philosophy, that it really was about doing the right thing for a true cosmonaut hero who sacrificed his life for his country. So figuratively speaking, Gagarin and Brezhnev went eyeball to eyeball over what to do with Komarov's death. After all, the Marxist-Leninist communist philosophy was that of never admitting any failures or accidents, and never before in the 50-year history of the Soviet Union had any major accident or failure ever been reported and made public, especially not in the middle of the celebrations marking the 50th anniversary of the Communist Revolution. However, this one time, it was Brezhnev who figuratively blinked first. Brezhnev apparently backed down when confronted by Gagarin, the great hero and icon of the Soviet way of life. Only as a result of the sheer willpower of Gagarin did the Soviet media ultimately, if not reluctantly, report the death of Komarov as being a valiant death.
at the controls of his spacecraft as a consequence of a tragic accident and that he was a true Soviet hero. Marxist-Leninist politics prided itself on being a scientific, objective analysis of human and natural law. And if you are really good at your Marxist-Leninist theory, then nothing in the real world should be less than perfect. So it was a great embarrassment not only to disclose this fact externally, but to have to admit it internally in the halls of power. The propagandists did slightly adjust the cause of the accident, as well as failing to report all of the design flaws that Gagarin and Komarov found with the spacecraft in the first place that caused the accident. Komarov was ultimately given a tremendous hero's funeral. His ashes were placed in the Kremlin Wall alongside other Soviet historical notables. I never met Komarov because they did not invite me to any receptions after my father was ousted of power. But it was tragedy to all of us, it was a big tragedy to my father. One thing was for sure, that Brezhnev would not soon forget being stung by Gagarin on this day and being embarrassed into admitting a major failure in Soviet technology. After Komarov's death, Gagarin's life was in a free fall, a tailspin. His behavior was becoming even more erratic and difficult for reporters to understand. Gagarin was making foolhardy statements like, quote, I don't know if I was the last dog in space or the first man in space, end quote. There was no place to turn for Yuri Gagarin. There was bad blood between Gagarin and Brezhnev. He was becoming more and more an outcast in Brezhnev's government. By early 1968, Gagarin wasn't welcome at government functions, even though he grudgingly attended them. Internally, he must have known that he was never going to fly jets or go into space again, especially after what happened to Komarov. I've seen at least three or four reports uh, from the State Department that describe Gagarin getting drunk at a government function in early 1968, and that he actually threw a glass of champagne in the face of Brezhnev in front of a bunch of dignitaries. Now, I can just imagine that if Gagarin was becoming so disrespectful of the Soviet leadership that Brezhnev would have gone to the head of the KGB and told him that enough was enough and it was time to make Gagarin something other than a live embarrassment. Then suddenly, Gagarin was sent an extremely odd message. He's allowed to fly in a jet again and allowed to re-qualify as a fighter jet pilot. Although official records are quite vague as to who precisely authorized such a flight. He's sent up in a MiG jet for the very first time in seven years on a so-called routine training mission. Then. On the very first day of the very first flight he takes, the jet suddenly, inexplicably crashes. And we're just told that Gagarin dies? Why was there no Mayday call? And why could neither he nor his co-pilot eject out when the jet experienced the engine failure? He just goes up, the jet crashes, and he dies? Bing bada boom, goodbye, thank you very much, and bring the curtain down on the sad and short life of Yuri Gagarin. Huh? Nobody thinks that there's anything wrong with the picture here? When we talk about the Gagarin death, it was mystery because nobody know, know what was happened. Of course, it was personal tragedy, it was national tragedy, it was world tragedy, because we lost the man 
in his young age when he was a hero. But from the other side, it is leaving uh, his image for the history. Maybe it was more in his interest that he leaving this young, smiling person. I've reached the point in thinking about what the Soviet Union managed to pull off in the way of lies to the outside world or lies to its own citizens or lies to itself, not to be surprised that something like that might have occurred. If he was killed, it probably was because they didn't want somebody telling the story or being undisciplined about it. Uh, unfortunately, we may never know whether he died of an accident or of a, of a murder. Well, it seems perfectly clear to me that Yuri Gagarin's death had the fingerprints of Leonid Brezhnev and the KGB all over it. And uh, I see it started with Vladimir Komarov's death and Gagarin's confrontations with the Soviet leadership over how Komarov was killed. To me, I see this untold story of Vladimir Komarov and his death. It was, um, it was more a story of true heroism. Uh, it was more of a story of a man who was willing to sacrifice himself to save his best friend. And for Yuri Gagarin, uh, that he was willing to make a stand and risk his own life and reputation in confronting the Soviet leadership to do the right thing, honoring his friend's death. It would be fascinating to see what other stories and what other secrets come to life from the trickle of information now or in the future released from the Russian archives about the old space race. Any society, whether it be capitalist, communist, totalitarian, or freely democratic is doomed to failure and extinction if it's based on deceit and lies and secrecy, just like what happened to the old Soviet Union. I, for one, can't in good conscience sit back and allow or tolerate falsified history books, governmental cover-ups, and international conspiracies to continue without question I feel we have planted a seed of questioning to begin to set the record straight about Vladimir Komarov and Yuri Gagarin and the practices and procedures of the old communist Soviet empire. I guess I leave history to the historians. <laughs>